like to welcome you all here. It's a blessing to be back. It's nice to get away last week, 17 year anniversary, my wife and I, and got to uh, visit uh, uh, Bob and Flo, a uh, brother and sister in Branson, Missouri. So very nice. It's always, it's also good to be back. Where today, I wanna continue with this uh, theme. You know, we've been looking at the uh, Trinity and oneness and or today, we're going to deviate just a little bit, but we're going to still focus on the relationship of the Father and Son by looking at Joshua's pre-existence. And as Deacon Steve already made mention, when we say pre-existence, this is referring to Joshua's existence prior to his birth as a man. So today we're going to focus on the evidence showing that Joshua existed prior to that birth, that natural birth. Now, we'll also talk about some concepts, by the way, the, the relationships between the father and son, how that works, how that doesn't work, whether they're equal, whether it's a duality. You know, there's some confusion with that, so we'll touch on that as we go through this message. This is very important to understand, I believe, the preexistence. Because when we understand the preexistence, you realize that Yahshua preexisted and that through him all things came into being, as we understand it, Scripture says. So it is important to realize and to acknowledge the great contributions that he gave during this time. So we'll see that as we go through this message. I want to begin with John chapter 1, verse 1. This is really the pivotal passage. This is the one most people will refer to. John chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to also look at verse or through 3 and also verse 14. So it says there, in the beginning was the Word. So the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim, the same was in the beginning with Elohim. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So that's verses 1 through 3. And then verse 14 says, And the word was made flesh, and it dwelt amongst us. And we beheld the glory, the uh, glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now I want to take an in-depth look at what we find here in John 1.1. I want to be, begin by asking, who is this word? What is this word? Well, the word comes from the Greek logos, and here's how it's defined by Strong's. You're going to see it's very broad in meaning. Logos means something said, including the thought, by implication, a topic, subject, or discourse, also reasoning, the mental faculty, or motive, by extension of computation spe uh, specifically. With the article in John, it says the divine expression, i.e., it says Christ, it's, that's in Strong's. So we see, according to uh, Strong's, that the word or logos, as we uh, find within the Greek, refers to the preexistent Messiah. It refers to Yahshua, the Messiah. Now, notice also what we find in verse 14, is there, there's this concept that the... Let's see here. Your purchase, so oh, I see where. Where is it? Hey, this was a gift in Branson, Missouri, and obviously did not check for tags. Well, thank you, Brother Lucas. We'll just edit that right out of the video later on. Where was I? Thank you, though. I'd hate, you know, the whole time. Just <laughs> So verse 14, I think we were focused on. Verse 14 says there, the word became flesh. This is very important because we find a connection between verses 1 and verse 14. And that word is the word of Yahweh or Yahshua the Messiah. Now, verse 1 here, this has always been challenging, especially for those who believe in the Trinity, and, and also oneness, by the way, they both use this to substantiate their, their belief on these two uh, theological uh, doctrines. And they will look at this word, theos, or as we see in the King James, God. So let's take a look at this a little bit closer. So again, I'm going to reread verse 1. It says, in the beginning was a word, and the word was with Elohim, the word was Elohim. So the King James would say uh, G-O-D or God. And so they say that the word, they recognize that the word does represent Yahshua the Messiah, but they say the word was with Elohim or, or G-O-D, and that would be with Yahweh, and they're right with that. But they would say that the word was then God or, or Theos. Therefore, Yahweh and Yahshua must be the same deity, the same divine essence as we find through the Trinity belief, or again, oneness as well. 
Now, it's important to understand this word theos. And by the way, we, the, the reason you see Elohim is Elohim is a Hebrew equivalent of theos, as we find within the Greek. So what is the meaning of the Greek word theos? Now, we've looked at this many times already through these messages I've given on the Trinity and oneness, but let's look at it one more time. The Strong's defines it theos in the following. It says a deity. A deity is simply a mighty one, some sort of exalted being. Also, it says uh, especially the divine uh, supreme divinity. This would be in reference to the Father. And also, fairly a magistrate. Magistrate is simply someone in an exalted position. A judge, for example, might be a magistrate. So there's many, many definitions that would apply with the Greek word atheos, and also the same would be true with the word Elohim. Now, again, they will assume that the word G-O-D or the word theos or Elohim in this reference would connect Yahweh and Yahshua with Yahweh, and they're, therefore they are the same being. Well, I want to read what we state in the King James or in the uh, RSB. I think this really explains much better the interpretation of what we find in the Greek. It says, the word refers to the pre-existent Messiah. We've already touched on that. So as John confirms, now this is another way of rendering this passage. It says, in the beginning was the Messiah, and the Messiah was with Yahweh, and the Messiah was a mighty one. So that's really a better meaning. Do you understand the distinction there? The Messiah was a mighty, the mighty one. In other words, the Messiah was not Yahweh. The, the Messiah was a mighty one. He was a, a deity, as we would find through the Greek word theos. Going on, uh, it says uh, the Greek word, uh, the Greek diglot clarifies by saying a mighty one was the word, the complete Bible, American translation reads, in the beginning, the word existed. The word was with Elohim and the word was divine. So you see the distinction there. It's saying the word was not Yahweh, the word was divine. There's a distinction between the two. So Elohim is generic for mighty ones. In the Old Testament, this word applies to Yahweh, false deities, angels, and man. The same thing's true for the most part with the Greek theos, by the way. Same meaning with the uh, Greek. It says in the context of this passage, Elohim refers to both the Father and the Son. And that's what we find throughout the uh, passage here, that the word Elohim or Theos, as we find in the Greek, is used in both reference to the Father and Son within John chapter 1, verse 1. Now, this passage, what's important here is to realize that there's a distinction between the Father and Son, that they're not the same, they're not the same being. John is not saying that the Father and Son are one in entity or one in divine essence. He's simply saying and pointing out that Yahshua was with Yahweh in the beginning, he was with the Father in the beginning, and he was a mighty one with the Father. And we'll see that as we go through this message, that Yahshua, too, he was glorified. He was, he was I hate to use the word in some ways, but he was a deity. He was, he was a mighty one in the Old Testament along with his Father. So we need to understand those distinctions. He was the Logos. He was the spokesman. He was the word of Yahweh, as we find here. Now, verse 3 also makes a very important point. Verse 3 shows and confirms that through him all things were made. It says, without, without him, nothing was made. Now, I know and I've heard people simply say that this word refers to Yahweh's plan, that it doesn't refer to Yahshua. Yahshua came later. The word was made flesh, but prior to the word being made flesh, the word was simply a plan. And yeah, we had the plan. Or the problem is the word in verse 14 is the same word in verse 1. And the word in verse 14 is Yahshua the Messiah. And we know that the word, again, as we find in verse 3, made all things. And again, this word is identified as Yahshua the Messiah. Verse 14 is such an important verse here. Matter of fact, you know, I think we see evidence of this in Genesis. If you go back and look at the account in Genesis, we see evidence of more than one being. Let's take a look at some examples. Genesis 1, verse 26. It says, Elohim said, let us make man in our image, or in our likeness, in our image, after our likeness. Genesis 3, verse 22 says, and Yahweh Elohim said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. So as we see here through the word us, this is an indication that there's more than one being present. There's more than one being present. It wasn't simply Yahweh there alone. We find that there was more than one being there in the beginning. Well, this is referring to, I believe, Yahweh and Yashwin, probably the angels. We know that they too were there, according to Job. 
but certainly it refers to the Father and Son, because again, based on John 1, 1 through 3, Yahshua was with Yahweh in the beginning, it says, and through him, through the Son, all things were made, and we see that here. Matter of fact, we're not going to look at it quite yet, but in Proverbs 30, verse 4, we find a real intriguing passage showing Yahshua's role in this process, showing not only that Yahshua existed, but also showing his contributions and really what he was doing during this time. So again, through this, uh, the object of pronouns here, the, the word us, it indicates both the father and son at creation. Yahweh was not alone. This is not only referring to Yahweh and angels, but to the son too, because again, as we saw in John 1, 1, Yahshua was with the father in the beginning, and he, and he was he was a mighty one too. He was an Elohim. He was a Theos, as we find within the Greek. Now, I want to go back to the New Testament. We find so many examples. Matter of fact, I want to go back to John 17, verse 5. John is, the book of John is an amazing book. We talked about this in the Bible study some today. There are the synoptic evangels or the gospels. Those are the first three, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're very similar in nature, very the same, many of the same accounts. But John is very unique. And here's where John is unique from the other three evangels. John really focuses on the divinity or the spirit essence of who Yahshua was prior to his birth. We see so many examples of this through the book of John. So let's look at one. John chapter 17, verse 5. This is a really important passage to remember. It says, and now, O Father, this is his prayer right before his, he died, right before his sacrifice. He says, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee, listen, before the world was. Before the world was. So Yahshua confirms here that before there was a world, right? He was with Yahweh. He was with the Father. Now, what does the word before mean? You know, it's important with messages like this that we go back to the Hebrew, that we go back to the Greek. In this case, a Greek is its New Testament. Well, the word before is from the Greek pro. It's a primary preposition meaning to be in front of or prior to. So that's what it means, to be in front of or, or prior to something. So based on what Yahshua is saying here, what, what, what's the message? What do we find? Where he's confirming that he existed before the world was, or before the world was, Yahshua, Yahshua existed. He was with Yahweh. He pre-existed before there was a universe. So before there were any stars, before there were any planets, Yahshua was there with his father, now, what does the word glory mean? It's an important word to understand. Well, the word glory comes from the Greek word doxa. And doxa, according to the Thayer's Greek lexicon, means a splendor, brightness, magnificence, excellence, preeminence, dignity, grace, and majesty. So these are the attributes that Yahshua shared with his father before there was a universe. You see, he had this excellence, he had this majesty, he had this uh, preeminence with Yahweh prior to the existence of this world. Now, you know, it's important to realize, number one, again, that, 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 that he, as we found in John 1, 3, that through him all things came into existence. But also, it's also important to realize what he gave up. You see, he gave this up so that he could come and die for the sins of mankind. And that's what we find also in uh, Philippians 2, that he came, he lowered himself, he humbled himself. He gave up this glory that he had with the Father before, before this universe, be, before being born as a man. Now, another truth we find all throughout John is that Yahshua's origins are from heaven. They're from above and not from beneath, not, for, not of this world. And we see this in many, many examples. I'm going to share with just a few with you. So here's what it says. Oh, here's pro, by the way. So primary preposition. Again, to be in front of or prior to, that's based on Strong's. Now, John 3.13 says, and this is Yahshua speaking. He says, no man has ascended up to heaven. Now, this, is a, this is, by the way, is a great passage for those who believe that we go to heaven after we die. Scripture does not teach that we go to heaven after we die. Scripture says that we go to the grave. It says, in that day our thoughts perish. It's based on Psalms 146 verse uh, 4, I think it is. And that our spirit, then our ruach, our, our life, returns back to Yahweh's uh, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. And then we wait for the resurrection. That's what the Bible teaches. It does not teach that we go to heaven after we die. 
And Yahshua says that here, no man has ascended up, to, up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Notice that. Notice the emphasis here. Where did Yahshua come down from? Did he come down from the earth? Did he come up from the earth? No, Yahshua says here that he came down from heaven. It says, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. By the way, the Synaticus, the Vaticanus, some of these older texts, Greek texts, omit that last part there. But, but it says, but he that came down from heaven. This shows and verifies for me that Yahshua's origins are not of this world, not of this earth, but existed prior to that. Or we see also an example of this in John 6, verse 30, and also verse 62. It says, for I came down from heaven. You know, I don't know how much more clear Yahshua could have been. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. You know, one of the truths we find with scripture, by the way, is that everything Yahshua did was patterned after the Father. He, he did nothing of his own. He was subservient to his Father in heaven. We're going on to verse 62. It says, what? And if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Notice that word before. You see, Yahshua went back to heaven where he was prior to being born as a man. One more passage. It says, <clears throat> and he said unto them, you are from beneath, meaning of the earth, right? It says, I am from where? I am from above. Again, showing his origin. You are of the world and I am not of this world. So again, before Yahshua was born as a man, we find here that his origin was not of the world, was not of the earth, was not from below or beneath, but, for, but, but from the heavens, from above, as we find from scripture. I wanna look at something he says in John 8. John 8, verse 56 through 58. He says here, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. Yahshua was speaking to the Jews here, and he was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? You know, he's saying, you're not old enough. You're, <clears throat> you know, he was only about 30 years of age. You know, how in the world could you see Abraham? Yahshua said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now the word I here is very, very important to understand. But Yahshua begins here by saying that Abraham rejoiced to see his day. Of course, we see here the Jews quickly rebuttaled this by saying that he wasn't yet 50 years old. He's, you know, you're a young guy yet. How in the world have you seen Abraham? So how did Yahshua respond? Or Yahshua said here, before Abraham was, I am. I am. Now the word I here is, is very important. It comes from the Greek word genomahi. Genomahi. Strong's defines this word as to cause to be, that is to become or come into being. That's the meaning of genomahi. Now Thayer's defines this word as to become, that is to come into existence, to begin to be or to receive being. So what is Yahshua saying here? What do we find in the Greek? Or Yahshua simply saying this, before Abraham existed, I existed. Before Abraham was born, I was. I came into being. This is the meaning of Gnomahi. There's no other way to really understand this. He is saying literally that he existed before Abraham. Now, of course, the Jews had an issue with this. Now, some will rebuttal this, those who deny the preexistence, and will say, well, this really has nothing to do with time or age. Well, the problem is, Yahshua's, re he's responding to the rebuttal by saying that he's not even yet 50 years old. This has everything to do with time and age. And Yahshua clarifies and confirms, again, through the Greek word, genomahi, <coughs> that he existed, he came into being, prior to the birth or the existence of the patriarch Abraham. So obviously, again, this deals with time and age. Now, in addition to Yahshua's own testimony, and, and there's other passages we could look at, maybe not as, as uh, clear as what we've seen, but certainly other passages, Yahshua confirming that he was from above, that he existed prior to being born as a man, Paul also speaks 
much about Yahshua's preexistence, and really, he's a great source for this truth. I want to begin by looking at something he says in 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. So he doesn't want us to be ignorant of this. He wants us to understand this truth. He's saying, How that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized. Notice baptism there. We'll come back to that. Unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did he all, and did he all eat of the same spiritual meat? And did all drink of the same spiritual drink? For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was who? It says here that that rock was Messiah. Now, before we talk about the preexistence here, what, what he says about the Messiah, Paul, I want to speak just briefly about what we find with baptism. Where it says here that Israel was <coughs> baptized unto Moses in the sea. Now, this is a reference, obviously, to the Red Sea, to when they crossed over after leaving Goshen, after leaving Egypt. And we see here that this represented a type of baptism. You know, based on this, there's actually three different types of baptism. I just, just point this out. So we see one baptism unto Moses, as we uh, see here in 1 Corinthians. We also know that there's a baptism of John the Baptist, John the Baptist. And of, you know, there, there's a third, of course, and that's through Yahshua the Messiah. That's the important baptism. Now, I believe that the baptism here unto Moses was, was only symbolic, but it, it is an example of a baptism we find through Scripture. Now, what was the difference, real quickly, between Yahshua's baptism and the baptism of John? Where John's baptism was one of only repentance, Scripture says. Yahshua's baptism was one of remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what we find in Acts 2, verse 38. So again, two promises with Yahshua's baptism, forgiveness of sins and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. You know, in Acts 19, we, we, we see an example, you don't have to turn there, but in, we see an example there of a group. They were immersed into John's baptism. You know, Paul comes along and he, he uh, begins talking about the Holy Spirit. And they, they, they weren't familiar with this Holy Spirit. So Paul asks, you know, what were you baptized unto? And, and they explain that they were baptized unto John's baptism. And then they were told and educated about Yahshua's baptism, and they were rebaptized, Scripture shows. So we do believe rebaptism in Yahshua's name is an important step as believers. Now we also see again Paul referring to Yahshua's preexistence. He says here that the rock that followed the Israelites was whom? The rock was, Yahshua the Messiah says. Now, the word followed is a little bit misleading. I get the impression that the rock is following behind the Israelites. And that's, that's not how that worked, by the way. The word uh, followed, it's Greek, of course. It means to uh, be of the same way with or to accompany. So, he, so, so this rock accompanied the Israelites. And again, this rock was none other than Yahshua the Messiah. Now, I believe that this rock also symbolizes the angel of Yahweh. We'll talk about that as we go through this message later on. But there's an angel of Yahweh, and the angel of Yahweh followed, accompanied, was with the Israelites in the wilderness. Or according to Paul, this angel was the rock. Obviously, the rock here is symbolic. I want to consider now what Paul says in Colossians 1. You know, I, I believe Colossians 1 is one of the most important passages with the preexistence, explaining Yahshua's role and how he fulfilled that role. Colossians 1, starting at verse 13, it says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, and whom we have redemption through his blood. So who are we speaking about here? Where do we find redemption? Or we find redemption through Yahshua the Messiah. So we're speaking about Yahshua the Messiah. It's very important to understand that. Very important to understand the context. Who is being spoken of here? Goes on to say even the forgiveness of sins. So again, we're still speaking about Yahshua the Messiah. Who is the image of the invisible L? The firstborn of every creature. We'll come back to that. For by him were all things created. Same thing, John 1, 1, uh, 1 3. And that are, in he that are in heaven, 
that are in earth, visible and invisible. So notice that Yahshua did not only create the physical universe. It says here he created those things that were invisible as well. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. Now I'm not gonna get a, go down a, a bunny trough for just a moment. There's this thing they call dark matter. I'm not a real big believer in dark matter. Maybe it exists. I tend to believe that dark matter is Yahshua's power. Because it says that through Yahshua, all things consist of this universe. You know, they, they don't understand how this universe holds together. So they have this theory of dark matter, right? You know, I, you know, I simply believe what scripture says, and that is through Yahshua, all things consist. He created all things and by him, all things occur and are here. So again, Paul is referring to Yahshua the Messiah. The context is very clear. Now, in verse 15, he first says that Yahshua is the image of the invisible L. The image of the invisible L. Now, the word image here is important. It comes from the Greek uh, icon. Icon refers to uh, literally likeness or resemblance. Now, logic states that if you resemble or, or like someone or something, you're not that thing, right? You're not that person. You know, for, for example, if a son resembles his father, that son is not the father. There are two different people, the same thing here. Yahweh and Yahshua, they resemble, they're like one another, but they're not the same being. And that's a truth that's important to understand. And that's one reason why the Trinity and oneness is not right. They're not one as spirit essence. They are distinct beings as we find scripturally. Now, it also says here that this uh, Yahshua, that he's a firstborn of every creature. Now, the word firstborn here comes from the Greek prostokos. Uh, and according to Thayer's, it means, quote, of Christ, the firstborn of all creation. Also, the word creature here is from the Greek kalisis, meaning original for foundation, uh, formation. So we see here, based on the definition in the Greek, that Yahshua is literally the firstborn of everything that's existed of creation, that he came first. And also we see here that he resembles or he is like the Father. So this confirms his preexistence again, that he existed prior to the universe. Matter of fact, it says here that all things were made through him, that literally everything consists through him, whether visible or invisible, it says. Now, we also see evidence for Yahshua's preexistence in Revelation 3, verse 14. This is Yahshua speaking to the seven assemblies, this time to the Laodicean assembly, the one that really had a lot of work to uh, do. It says, and unto the angel of the assembly of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning, the beginning of the creation of El. Now, it's important to realize here that number one, Yahshua was one speaking. It's not real hard to prove. Yahshua is speaking here, he's, and he's communicating to the seven assemblies. So what does he say here about his own existence? What does he say? Or it says here that he was the beginning of the creation of El. What does the word beginning mean here? Or the word beginning, it is from RK, and this word literally means, according to Strong's, a commencement or chief in various applications of order, time, place, or rank. I want to look also at the Thayer's Greek lexicon. This is, provides a more thorough explanation of what this uh, Greek word means. So number one, the first definition of Thayer's is beginning or origin. Beginning or origin. Notice the definitions. Number two, the person or thing that com uh, commences, the first person or thing in a series, a leader. Number three, that by which anything begins to be the origin, the active cause. Number four, the extremity of a thing. And number five, the first place, principality, rule, used of angels and de demons. So based on this, which definition do you think would apply to our Savior? Well, the first three definitions involve what? The first three definitions involve time. That is a commencement. That is a beginning. That is an origin. So the best definition would be, as we also see in John 1, 1, and also Colossians 1, verse 15, that Yahshua literally preexisted and that he was the first of Yahweh's creation. He was the first. Nothing else came before the Messiah. Now, again, this means, though, that Yahshua had a beginning. 
This, for most, would be considered heretical teaching because the Trinity and oneness both state that Yahweh and Yahshua, the Father and Son, are co-eternal. Well, that's not what we find here, is it? Because it says here, this is Yahshua again speaking. Yahshua says, so it confirms that he was the first of creation, of Yahweh's creation. You know, I don't know how much more clear it could be. You know, really, it's amazing the clarity of both the Messiah and Paul on this issue. He says that he preexisted, again, that he was the beginning of Yahweh's creation. Now, we also find evidence, I believe, from the Old Testament. That's not obviously as clear because we don't have Yahshua speaking, but I do believe we can see evidence of Yahshua's preexistence in the Old Testament. We'll look at two key passages in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 8, verse 22. Now, I'm going to read through verse 30. It says, Yahweh possessed me in the beginning of his way. Now, I want you to really listen to what is being communicated here. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mounds were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. So notice, whoever this is speaking about existed before these things, before the earth, before the depths. Was yet he had not made the earth nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Now, obviously, this passage is speaking about a being, about someone. Some say, by the way, this is simply referring to wisdom. Because that's what we find at the beginning of this passage, wisdom. Or Yahshua here is being spoken of, and he's wisdom personified. That's what we find here. Now, it says in verse 22 that Yahweh possessed this being. Or in the Hebrew, this is kana. It means to uh, erect or to create, that's the meaning of this Hebrew word. So we see here that this uh, being that's being described here was possessed or he was created by Yahweh in the beginning. And as we see here, this was before the earth existed. This was before there, there were fountains of the deep. This was before anything existed on this earth, including the earth. So who was with Yahweh in the beginning? Who existed with the Father before the universe existed. Where again, according to John 1.1, 1, 1, Yahshua says that he was the Word and that as a Word, he was with Yahweh and that through the Word, through him, all things came into being. You know, it's real simple. Colossians, we see the same thing, that he was the beginning of the creation of El. We see that also in Revelation 3, verse 14. So we know, based on Yahshua's testimony, based on what Paul says, as well, that Yahshua existed, and he was with Yahweh before the earth and the universe existed. He was, again, the word, the preexistent logos. Now, I want to focus for a few moments on verse 30. Verse 30 is an important passage. It says here, as one brought up with him. Now, this uh, phrase, one brought up, one brought up, you'll see this highlighted. This is from the Hebrew, Anon. Uh, I'm sorry, Amon, not Anon, Amon. And uh, here's how this word is defined. Strong's defines this word as in the sense of training, skilled, that is an architect. Amon, based on the Brown Driver and Briggs Hebrew lexicon, keep in mind this is Hebrew, it's Old Testament. It says an architect, a master workman, a skilled workman. Or where do we get, just for a moment, where do we get this this uh, phrase, as we've seen, is one brought up. Well, this is actually the primitive root of, of this Hebrew word. I'm not sure why King James decided to uh, use this in place of the actual word that we find in the Hebrew. 
but it actually means a skilled workman. That's what we find, a skilled workman. So this wisdom personified was with Yahweh before the world existed as a skilled workman. That's what it says. That's what we find within the Hebrew. You know, I believe that this passage offers incredible insight into what Yahshua was doing. You see, Yahweh gave the plan. He set the compass. He understood it was his plan. And he spoke his plan to his son. And his son, as the master workman, carried out that plan. That's what we find here in, in Proverbs 8. That is a relationship I believe scripture shows, that, that Yahweh has the plan, he had the plan, he gave that plan to his son. He said, oh, his son, as, as my master workmen, carry this plan out. And that's what we find again, according to John 1, 3, it says, through him all things were made. You see, when scripture says that, that he spoke, the universe and the creation, he's, he spoke it through his son. The son has always been the mediator. The son has always been that bridge between our father and mankind. And that wasn't only true at his death, but it's also true in creation, that through his son, he created all things. So again, Yahweh's plan, and I, you know, I believe that's important, by the way, to really recognize that point that it was Yahweh's plan, that he's the one that put the compass out, that he's the one that had this engineered, if you will, that, that he was the architect. He drew it all out, but the son did it. But Yahweh's plan, because, you know, Yahweh had a part in this too, and that's an important aspect of this to understand. This is, again, why understanding Yahshua's preexistence is so important. When we deny Yahshua's preexistence, we, we deny these great contributions, and I believe that it certainly is a dishonor to the son when we refuse to recognize what he did. Now, Proverbs 30 verse 4 also offers insight in this. And by the way, just for those who may not know, Proverbs 30 verse 4, this is a real foundational passage for the sacred name. A man named uh, Clarence O'Dodd, C. O'Dodd, oh, in the late 30s, early 40s, came along. He was with the uh, Church of God seventh day, and uh, him, along with another man uh, called uh, named uh, Herbert Armstrong, came out, and they both recognized the Sabbath, but they both felt that the feast days were important, so, so they left that organization, and, and um, they started their own organizations or movements. Of course, uh, many of you are familiar with Herbert, Ar Herbert Armstrong, but there was a di distinction between C. O. Dodd and Herbert Armstrong. C. O. Dodd, based on Proverbs 30, verse 4, believed that the name of Yahweh was important and the name of Yahshua was important. And he based that on this passage. This passage really has um, some meaning for us here uh, as far as the roots of, of this ministry and others um, like us. So let's read it. Proverbs 30, verse 4. It says, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment, who hath established all the ends of the earth. What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Again, very important passage for us from an organizational standpoint. But we see here that it asks, what is his name? And also, what is his son's name? Now, what is this passage referring to? What is it speaking about? Where it's referring to creation. It's talking about when he established the earth. This is a reference to the creation of this earth and, and obviously the universe. So how could it ask what the son's name if Yahshua did not exist, if the son was not present? Why would it ask this within the context we find here? Because again, what we find here is a description of, of creation. We find here Yahweh setting the bounds to the earth. And we find here that the, the, the father was there. What is his name, it says. Of course, we know what that name is. And then it says, what is his son's name? Indicating that the son too existed at this point. I'd like to transition now and, and, and talk a little bit, or talk, 
focus on what Yahshua says in John 5, 37 for just a few moments, and also the angel of Yahweh. So let's look at John chapter 5, verse 37. It says, And the Father himself, this is Yahshua speaking, the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Now listen to what Yahshua says here. This is such an important truth to accept and realize and understand. It says, You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. So Yahshua says, this is the son speaking. And he says, he confirms here that we have neither, what? We have neither heard his father, right? Or seen his shape. Now, if no man has ever heard or seen the father, who then represents the Yahweh we find in the Old Testament? You know, we find examples of Yahweh. We'll, we'll look at those, some of those examples. For instance, appearing before Abraham. You know, who was that if no man has ever heard or seen the Father? Or we believe it was a preexistent Messiah. We believe it was the Logos. The word, as we see in John chapter 1, verse 1, that he literally represented the Father in the Old Testament. And I'm going to talk about this relationship as we go through this. Let's, let's take a look at Genesis 18, verse 1. It says, and Yahweh appeared unto him, and we know this is speaking about Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them for the, uh, from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Notice he bowed himself. He realized that these men were something special. Bowing is a sign of respect, is a sign of reverence. So we see here that one of these men are identified as Yahweh, that Yahweh says appeared before Abraham. So specifically, who is Yahweh here? Who does this represent? Or again, Yahshua says that no man has ever heard or seen the Father. We know that. So could this be the Father if no, if no man has ever heard or seen the Father? Or the answer is no, this cannot be the father because again, Yahshua says no man has ever seen or heard the father. So who then does this represent? Or we believe that this represents Yahshua the Messiah. Remember, Paul in Colossians 1 verse 15 says that Yahshua is or was the image of the invisible L. He's, and remember the word image comes from the Greek icon, icon literally means resemblance or likeness. So he is the resemblance of the invisible L. The invisible L there obviously is a reference to the Father. So he is the likeness or image or resemblance of the Father. So based on that and also the fact that we know that he was with Yahweh, we believe again that this he is the preexistent Messiah. This is a Logos. This is the word of Yahweh. This is the one who came and represented his father here on earth. I want to stop here and clarify a few points. And, and uh, you know, I've heard some people say things like, um, Yahshua was the Yahweh of the Old Testament. And I want to clarify that for just a, just a moment. You know, when I hear this, I often cringe because Yahshua was not the Yahweh of the Old Testament. He was the physical manifestation of Yahweh of the Old Testament. Does that make sense? D does that distinction make sense? So you have Yahweh of the Old Testament, right? And then you also have a physical manifestation of Yahweh. The physical manifestation is what we find in Genesis 18. That this physical manifestation is called Yahweh. So we know that this is not the Father, but Yahweh did nonetheless exist. And that's why this is important to realize because some people, they say, and they have this belief that the Father and Son are the same being. So when we say things like that, we're giving credence to this concept that there's no distinction between the Father and Son, even in the Old Testament. But there is a distinction. There is a distinction. So we have Yahweh, the Father, and then we have also the physical manifestation of Yahweh. And this is represented through the sun, through the logos, through the debar. 
Now, I also want to point out that even though we have two Yahwehs, there's still a relationship between the two. There's distinct beings. And also the Father is still greater than the Son. Some people believe in this concept of a duality, of a equality is maybe a better word, that the Father and Son are equal. Well, I don't think the Father and Son's ever been equal. They will never be equal. The Father is always greater than the Son. Yahshua said that in the New Testament. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says the same thing, that the Father is greater than the Son, that Yahweh is greater than, the, 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 than Yahshua. So again, there's, there's no equality, not in the old, not in the new, not ever, between the Father and Son. But both did exist. Now, what was... Yahshua's name in the Old Testament. This is a little, this is a little bit of a, a debate, but I believe we find the answer maybe in Genesis 19, verse 24. 19, Genesis 19, verse 24 says, And Yahweh reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. Notice this. So how many beings do we have here? Two, right? We have two beings. What are their names? Yahweh and Yahweh. So it says, Yahweh rained down fire and brimstone from Yahweh out of heaven. Now I want you to also notice, where did the fire and brimstone come from? It came from heaven, from, from Yahweh the Father, showing that Yahweh still provides all things. The Father provided the fire and brimstone, not the Son. It's an important distinction, I believe, to recognize. But here, we believe that the Yahweh on earth is again the Logos, the preexistent Messiah, Yahshua, and the Yahweh in heaven then would represent Yahweh the Father. So we have two beings, both named Yahweh, and yet one is on earth in this case, and the other one is in heaven. Now, I want to stop here and explain a truth that I believe is important. You know, based on the evidence we find in Scripture, Yahshua's name changes based on his role. Does that make sense? Yahshua's name changes based on his role. And let me explain that further. In the Old Testament, we see here that there's two Yahwehs. Or we know that in the Old Testament, Yahshua was the Logos. Yahshua was a spokesman. Yahshua was the one who spoke and acted on behalf of his father, right? He had Yahweh's name. He had Yahweh's name. In the New Testament, he brings salvation to mankind through what? Through Yahweh. His name literally means Yahweh of salvation, Yahshua. So his name reflects today his purpose. And that is to bring salvation from his father to mankind. Now, in Jeremiah 23, verse 6, we find a truth that says that Yahshua's name will change again to Yahweh or righteousness in the millennial kingdom. You know, if you look at the millennium and you understand the purpose of the millennium, you're, you're gonna realize that the whole purpose is to restore righteousness back to this earth so that Yahweh the Father can come with his holy city. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 describes this. He says that before the Father can come, that all enemies must be subdued, including death. So until sin and death are removed, the Father cannot return. Or guess whose role it is to restore righteousness in the millennium? Yahshua's role. And his name will change to reflect his purpose. And by the way, we also see the sacrifices coming back at this time. I believe that this also ties in with this name change. Today he is Yahshua. We have the opportunity to accept that blood of our Savior, but in the millennium, his name will change and his purpose will change. And those who did not accept, who live through, will have to go as we find through Scripture, the um, Levitical priesthood once more. I'm, a, I'm not going to go into all that, but you can look at that in Ezekiel 40 through 47 if you want. Okay, one more passage. Exodus 23, verse 20, actually two more. Exodus 23, verse 20. 
This is a reference to the angel of Yahweh. It says, Behold, I sent an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Now notice, I want you to notice these attributes. They were to obey his voice. The voice of who? This angel. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon, he will not forgive your transgressions, your sins. For my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. So this passage is speaking about the angel of Yahweh that, that accompanied or was with the Israelites in the wilderness. Now, by the way, this is, goes back to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, that this, this rock, this angel was the Messiah. We know that. Now, we also see, though, parallels between this angel of Yahweh and the Messiah. I want you to look at these. Matter of fact, we have a note in the Restoration Study Bible on this. It says the angel of Yahweh here is probably a reference to the preexistent Messiah. Now, notice the attributes they share in common. It says, and there are several significant parallels between the angel of Yahweh and the Messiah. For example, they both require obedience, right? We're to obey our Savior. We're to follow him. We're to do as he did. We're to worship as he worshiped. Same thing with this angel. Had authority over sin. We know that Yahshua was delegated the authority to forgive sin, and then also contained Yahweh's name. This is, you know, an elder years ago pointed out to me, there's no angel with Yahweh's name. Now we see that with men, but not an angel. Like Gabriel, it is not Yahweh's name. Michael, same thing. We don't see evidence of, of an angel with Yahweh's name except for this one. And guess who also shared Yahweh's name? According to Matthew 1 verse 21, of course, his name is Yashwin. We also see uh, in John chapter 5, verse um, oh, 37, I think, but anyway, in there, it says that, my fa I, that I come in my Father's name, he said. I come in my Father's name. And that's one reason why we believe it's Yahshua, because he came in his Father's name. Scholars agree that the name means Yahweh is salvation. And he came in his Father's name, so it's Yahshua. Yahshua. Now for me, besides a name, and I think that's really important to recognize that this angel had Yahweh's name and, and, and Yahshua said he came in his father's name. So let's see, we, we see the parallel there. But I, you know, I believe also very important is this, this ability to, to forgive transgressions, to forgive sin. You know, the Jews, they made a real big deal about this with Yahshua. Remember that? You know, how, how can you forgive sin? Only Yahweh can forgive sin. Matter of fact, that's a whole, the, 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 the Trinity essentially started on the same premise because Athanasius, if you remember the message, uh, three or four messages ago, Athanasius, his whole reasoning behind the Trinity was that if the Messiah was not Yahweh, he could not atone for man's sins. Well, where in scripture does it say that? Where in scripture does it say that the son must be the father to atone for the sins of mankind? The thing they miss is that as a son, he was delegated the authority to forgive sin. And we see that this angel contains the same authority. That just as Yahshua was able to forgive sin, this angel too can forgive sin. Because it says here, be careful. Because he may not pardon your transgressions. This is another way of saying he may not forgive your sin. He may not forgive your sin. So we see a parallel, another parallel with this angel and Yahshua the Messiah. Now I want to look at one more passage. This is going back to Acts. Of course, we know this is Stephen, by the way, speaking, Deacon Stephen. And uh, here's what he says. This is he. Now, some people get confused here. They, they think it's, he is a reference to the angel. It's, it's not, in all fairness, it's to Moses. This is he, Moses, that was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel, with the angel, which spoke to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Now, many believe that Yahweh was the one, that the Father was the one who, who spoke and gave the commandments to Moses. 
But what did we find here? Do we see that? Do we see evidence that, that Yahweh the Father gave the commandments to Moses? Or number one, again, just, just to remind you, Scripture says that no man has ever heard or seen the Father. Moses heard something. So I think based on that, it, it wasn't the Father. But Stephen, according to Stephen here, he says it was an angel. It was an angel who spoke to Moses and also gave, as it says here, the lively oracles. Now, the lively oracles, this is simply another way of saying the commandments. He spoke to Moses and gave the commandments, an angel. Now, what's the meaning of the word angel? The word angel comes from the Greek angelos, means a messenger, especially an angel. You know, by default, a messenger is subservient to the one giving the message, right? I mean, if I tell someone, do this, well, obviously, they're, they're in a position, a subservient position. Based on this fact, we know that the Father is not subservient. The Father is not subservient to anyone. He is above all, all of creation. So this cannot be the Father. So who is this? Or we believe, again, that this is a reference to Yahshua the Messiah. Again, he was a logos. He was, he was the debar, as we find in the Hebrew. By the way, the word debar is, is a Hebrew equivalent to, to logos. And it simply means a messenger. And that's what we find here. That, that he communicated, that he was the spokesman. Again, he, you know, think of Yahshua as this bridge. I think the best way to look at Yahshua in the, in the role of between Yahweh and mankind is, is Yahshua has always served, he's a bridge. And he was a bridge in the Old Testament. He's a bridge today. Scripture says that he's a mediator. You know, that, that's why we pray, by the way, in Yahshua's name. Because we, we go through Yahshua. We also know that Yahshua's there with his father. You know, I often look at the Messiah as somewhat of a uh, defense attorney. You know, Satan's accusing us, Scripture says, constantly before the Father. I think Yahshua's saying, look, I've been there. I was a man. I know the pools. He's defending us. He's that bridge. He's that mediator. Just as we find here with Moses, that as Moses was communicated and given the oracles from an angel, same angel, same messenger, same to bar, same logos, same spokesman today, communicating on behalf of his Father. So this is, I believe, who we find here here in Acts. It was not the Father, because again, he says an angel spoke. I want to summarize the, uh, some of the major points we've looked at. So here's a summary. Yahshua was with Yahweh in the beginning as the word, and the, again, the word is logos in the Greek. The Hebrew is uh, debar. It's John 1, 1 through 3. Uh, Yahshua was there in Genesis with the Father. We saw that. Let us make man in our image. They have become like one of us. Again, uh, showing that there was more than one being present. Yahshua shared in Yahweh's glory before creation. A very important passage, John 17, verse 5, that he was with Yahweh before the world existed, before the world was. Yahshua came down from heaven, and there's many other passages showing that. John 3, 13, Yahshua existed before Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am, he said. He existed. Genomahi. Yahshua was a rock that followed the Israelites, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. Yahshua was the first creation of El and firstborn of every creature. That's Revelation 3, 14. And also Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Another slide here, Yahweh possessed. And again, remember the word possessed here means he's, he was created. He was created. Yahshua, before creation, Yahshua was with Yahweh as a master builder. That's what we find in the Hebrew. He was a master builder. He was a skilled craftsman. Proverbs 8, verse 30, and also 30, verse 4. Yahshua was the physical manifestation of Yahweh in the Old Testament. Physical manifestation. It was not Yahweh. It was not the Father, but he was the physical manifestation of the Father in the Old Testament. Genesis 19, verse 24. One Yahweh on earth, one Yahweh in heaven. Yahshua was the angel of Yahweh in the Old Testament, Genesis 22, 15 through 17, and also Exodus 23, 20 through 22. Remember the parallels there that, that, that he could pardon transgression, he could forgive sin, 
that Yahweh's name was within this angel, just as Yahshua came in his father's name, many other parallels. And uh, the last one here is an angel, likely Yahshua delivered the commandments to Moses from Mount Sinai. He was the one who communicated and spoke on behalf of his father. Just real quick on that note, it's important to realize, and I'm gonna say this, the commandments belong and were given from Yahweh the Father. And they were spoken and communicated on behalf of Yahshua the Son. Does that make sense? But that's an important distinction to realize that everything we find in the Old Testament was that it says something like, I am Yahweh or thus says Yahweh. Those are the words of Yahweh the Father. But they're being communicated on behalf of his Devar, his Logos, his, his, his spokesman in the Old Testament. Well, I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. I hope it's helped you understand maybe a little bit better the preexistence and the importance of the preexistence. Again, I believe this is so important because Yahshua not only came and died for our sins, and that's very, very critical, important to understand, but he also was with Yahweh in the beginning, and through him all things came into existence. So without the Son, without Yahshua, none of us would be here today. Yahweh had the plan. Yahshua carried out that plan. And he brought, again, all this into existence. So when we deny the preexistence, we deny these contributions that Yahshua made. And I believe it's important that we understand this. So I pray that it's been eye-opening, and I pray that we continue to study, continue to uh, strive to understand the deeper truths of Scripture, because you know, it's important not only that we obey, but that we also understand truths of this nature. So uh, may Yahweh bless you.